Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the work session for this month. Uh, I'll announce that the board did meet an executive session what? on a real estate issue and a legal issue. <clears throat> Mr. Gentile, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Mr. D'Amelio? Here. Uh, Mr. Oliva will not be here this evening. Mr. McCluskey? Here. Mr. Siegel? Here. Mr. Lewis? Here. Mr. McGarity? Here. Dr. Hart? Here. And uh, Mr. Holmes is also out of town, will not be here this evening. Mr. Wexler? Here. Okay, we have several presentations on the agenda for this evening. The first is by our auditors, Barbara Kane Thornton, on the 2017 audit. Presentation on that, Jim? I'd just like to introduce, this is Stephen Kutsuflakis. He's a CPA and partner with Barbara Kane Thornton. Uh, they are headquartered out of Wilmington, Delaware, and they are experts in the field of governmental and non-for-profit accounting and auditing uh, with over 40 clients in the field. So welcome. Thank you, Amy. All right. Thank you. Okay. Like um, Amy said, we are engaged by the Township to audit their financial statements as of for the year end of December 31st, uh, 2017. Um, my name is Steve Fitzflex. I'm a partner with the firm. Uh, there are two reports that the township files. The first one is called a DCD report, and that's what to do with the Department of Community and Economic Development. And that was prepared by us and submitted by Amy online by the, the due date of April 1st, 2018. So that one has been completed, and that's a regulatory report that puts it in the format of the DCUXC. The second set of statements, the basic statements right now, will be issued in June of 2018. Right now, the holding point with that is that the Hefford Township, the free library, is concluded in the township financial report, and that audit will not be completed, completed until May 15th. So once we get that, we'll drop those numbers in and finalize the report, and that's anticipated to happen in June. Uh, we did give the township's finance team an unmodified opinion. Uh, that's a clean opinion, so it's the, it's the best you can receive. And basically, that means that we feel that your statements are, are free of material misstatement, and that they're fairly presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Um, the t we also perform what's called a single audit, and that's because the township spends more than $750,000 in federal awards, um, and that report will also be issued in June of 2018. And we also give the township an unmodified opinion on compliance, and, and basically that means that we feel that you're complying with federal regulations. The program that we looked at that is your biggest program by far is your community development block grant. Uh, of the township's total federal dollar spent this past year, which, which a little bit over a million dollars, that program accounted for $791,000 or 78% of that total. So that's the program we would have uh, looked at. And we look at how you spent the money and in, in addition to filing the required reports and, and procurement. Those are types of things that we look at. And the township checked that all right. Um, some of the results from this, this past year, uh, these show the township's three most significant funds, which are your general fund, your capital projects fund, and your, and your SOAR fund. Mm -hmm. And all the funds this year experienced an increase. The general fund and SOAR fund experienced increases from the previous year. Um, the one, the one exception was your capital projects fund, which uh, had a decrease. It went from uh, about, I'm sorry, it dropped quite a bit this year. And the reason being is you're spending the proceeds from your bond issue in the previous year for, for the building projects. So that was anticipated. Okay. Um, general fund ended the year with a fund balance of 18 point uh, five billion, five million dollars of that total, 9.5 is considered to be what's considered unassigned, which may, basically means the township can use it for any purpose, and the rest is either restricted or, or committed. Okay. Um, some trends from year to year for the general fund. Um, this year, the general fund revenue went from 42.2 million up to 43.4 million dollars. The most significant increase, the reason for the increase there was your, the increase in your tax millage rate this year. There was an increase of 2.67%. Um, so this year it was 7.993 mills versus 7.785 the year before. Overall exp expenditures increased by 1.5 million from the previous year. And the two large, two areas that experienced the largest increases were your police department, the police function, and also debt service. Um, this year the general fund made a transfer to the capital projects fund of $2 million compared to about a million dollars a year before. Um, and you also received the transfer of funds in from the SOAR fund of $600,000, which is the same as, as the previous year. Uh, this year, the general fund experienced an increase in their fund balance of $708,000. And the township did uh, budget a balanced budget this year. Um, so you did better than your budget by $708,000. Um, the SOAR fund, the last three years, uh, fairly consistent from year to year. This year, the SOAR fund had revenues of $5 million versus expenses of 3.5. 
and those are right in, in line with the, the previous two years. Okay. Um, the funded status of your pensions, as of December 31st, uh, 2017, the police pension fund was 72.19% funded uh, versus the previous year it was 66.19% funded. And then the township is current on all the required payments, the required MMO was, was made. Um, and it was a non-uniform pension, 77.87% funded versus 70.2% the year before. So both plan, plans are better funded as of this current year. Is that all stock appreciation, not, not cash going in, right? Right, yeah, mostly changes, yeah. Because this percentage, that, that's just based off of market rate, of market fair value. But yeah, so it's a lot of that has to do with the, the increase in your investments. And then another plan that the, the township has is their other post-employment uh, obligations uh, benefits, which are um, benefits to retirees other than pensions, so you have your health care benefits. Uh, for the police pension, as of January 1st, 2017, there's a liability out there of 40, almost $41 million, and the non-uniform plan had a liability of, of $4.4 million. Um, and as of right now, the township has not set any, side to fund, any funds aside to, to fund this. So it's different than your pension plans. Okay. Um, then other uh, uh, communications. This year, we only had one minor audit adjustment, which uh, Amy agreed to. It was expected. It was, uh, it was not material, but she made it. Um, next year, there's a new GASB standard that kicks in. It's uh, GASB 75. The county finance reporting for your post-employment benefit obligations. And that previous slide that I mentioned, they showed the liability of $40 million and, and $4 billion. Next year, that will be reflected in your financial statements. So that will be a change next year. Um, during the audit, management did cooperate with us. We didn't know, there were no disagreements. And before this meeting, we did review the results of the audit with Amy in detail. We sat down with Matt so She was well aware of all the results. But take any questions? That's a big picture overview. Any questions from the board? No. Steve, thank you very much. It was very well done. Thank you. Our next presentation is by Liz Smith of SEPTA. Changes and improvements to the high-speed line through the township. Good evening. I'm Liz Smith, Director of Strategic Planning and Analysis at SEPTA and Project Manager for the King of Prussia Rail Project. Uh, we recently reached a, a fairly major milestone in the project with release of the draft environmental impact statement, um, and we want to now come out to some of the existing communities along the Norristown High Speed Line that stand to benefit for the project and give you guys an overview, make sure you're aware of where we are in the project and where we're going. So I'll certainly keep things brief tonight, but just want to make sure that we're all up to speed on where the project is. There we go. Uh, so this is SEPTA's current system map uh, for subway and, and surface rail. Uh, the yellow star that you see there represents the King of Prussia area, which is not currently served at all by rail. It's about three miles away from the closest rail line. It is, however, served fairly well by bus with six bus lines uh, traveling out to the King of Prussia area um, with very high ridership for as far as suburban routes go. Almost 6,000 people a day utilize our buses to come out to King of Prussia. Um, but because most of those buses utilize the Schuylkill Expressway to go between Center City and King of Prussia and those buses get stuck in the same traffic that you or I would get stuck in, they're some of our lowest performers. So currently we're providing a fairly unreliable ride out to that area. Um, so as such, we've been looking at better options for how to serve it. And it's really important that we do serve King of Prussia in a better way via transit. It is the largest employment center outside of Philadelphia, a third largest in the entire region, only behind University City and Center City, uh, with about 60,000 jobs, a large chunk of them located 
both around the mall area as well as in the business park area to the north of the mall. It's also a really important piece of Montgomery County and the region in terms of tourism. While most malls are seeing declining visits on an annual basis, the King of Prussia Mall is holding steady, if not increasing, with about 20 million visits per year. That number always blows my mind a little bit. I didn't know there was that much to buy, but apparently there is. Um, and then Valley Forge National Historical Park is also north of the mall, and that sees another 2.1 million visitors per year. In terms of its economic impact on Montgomery County, um, there are about $43 billion in consumer expenditures that happen annually just within 30 minutes of King of Prussia itself. So we are looking at a better way to serve it by an extension of the Norristown High Speed Line. Uh, we've been at work in the planning process for this project for about the past five years. Uh, those five years have resulted in us selecting a route. As of January, SEPTA's board has endorsed this route as our locally preferred alternative. Um, it is a spur extension, so it doesn't come off the end of the Norristown High Speed Line. It actually comes off in the middle uh, between DeKalb Street Station and Hughes Park, which means we'll have service that runs between 69th Street Transportation Center and King of Prussia, uh, as well as between Norristown Transportation Center and King of Prussia. Um, shown here on the map, the alternative that was selected was the Pico Turnpike First Avenue alternative, uh, named as such because it travels through Pico right-of-way, Pennsylvania Turnpike right-of-way, behind the mall and then along First Avenue in the business park. There's five planned stations. Each of those white dots that you see um, on the map there is a planned station and it is fully elevated for the most part in nature, sitting about 17 feet off the ground. This is what we expect it to look like, because as soon as we say elevated rail, people tend to jump to the Market Frankfurt elevated as an example of what it would look like, but this is quite different. Um, first off, we just don't build things quite like we build the L anymore. Um, there's now ways to design structures so that they're sleeker and smaller and leave less of a kind of visual footprint. And that's, as you can see here, this is actually looking at the, the new expanded part of the mall. And you can see here, this is sitting in the median of Mall Boulevard. These columns that it sits on only need about four to eight feet of width. So in this case, we're not even taking a travel lane from Mall Boulevard. Some quick fast facts about the extension. It's 4.5 miles of elevated rail. Those five new stations will be fully ADA compliant stations, which is a really big deal for the Norristown High Speed Line, as primarily most of our stations on that line are not ADA compliant. There will be two park and ride facilities associated with the extension, one at the Western Terminus uh, in the business park in the vicinity of the Valley Forge Casino, and another um, along Henderson Road, kind of on the eastern side of the extension, uh, where people will be able to have some significant parking areas. Total increase in ridership as a result of the extension is an additional 9,500 daily trips which just about doubles ridership on the Norristown High Speed Line. Today we see about 10,000 trips per day. And that was estimated using Federal Transit Administration guidelines, which are relatively conservative and don't do a good job of estimating retail or tourism-based trips. So we expect that we will actually see a bigger number than that. Um, it is a two-seat ride to travel into University City and Center City. You would take the Norristown High Speed Line to the Market Frankfurt Line, but it is a very easy connection at 69th Street. It's pretty much one stairway. Uh, really, one of the, the, the biggest uh, exciting facts about this project is the change in travel time. So right now, if you were to take a bus from 13th and Market out to King of Prussia, the scheduled bus time is about 55 to 60 minutes. That bus only runs on time about 76 to 78 percent of the time or less. I'm sorry, 65 to, to 68 percent of the time. Um, we commonly see trip times of over 120 minutes and standing room only on the bus, so that's a pretty terrible ride out there. Uh, using the extension in the Market Frankfurt line, you would have a total trip time from 13th and Market all the way to the western terminus of the extension of under 40 minutes. So that is a tremendous decrease. We are estimating on average that uh, each commuter would get about an hour of their day back, 30 minutes each way from their current commute. I want to talk for a minute about how this project affects the region, and then we'll bring it down to how it affects Haverford Township. Uh, one of the most important facets of this project is that it does connect regional employment centers, which will make the region as a whole stronger. This shows our three largest employment centers, King of Prussia with 60,000 jobs in the upper left, University City is the second largest with 75,000 jobs, and then Center City with almost 300,000 jobs. And this project connects all three uh, via the Market Frankfurt Line and the Norristown High Speed Line. 
It's also a smart investment for the region, although the total capital cost is about $1.2 billion, which is certainly on par with other similar extensions and transit systems across the country. Uh, there's plenty of data that shows that for every dollar invested in public transportation, you see about $4 back in economic returns. And we have some anecdotal data for our current area that shows uh, a significant increase in property values within the proximity of a station. I'm not sure um, if any of you have had a chance to read through a report that was recently released called SEPTA Drives the Economy. Uh, there was a lot of detailed economic analysis in that report, including um, some analysis by eConsult that was able to really um, isolate property value gains as a result of proximity to transit. And in Montgomery County, where the extension will be located, it saw that, that on, in general, within about a mile to two miles of a station, a 20% increase in property value solely attributed to SEPTA. Um, and actually, even some greater property value increases shown in Delaware County. Um, we also know that this will increase commercial values as well, which obviously helps to um, offset and increase some tax revenue. It is also a very convenient and reliable way to connect people to opportunities. As I mentioned, we do have a good bus service out there, but it's very low performer in terms of our overall bus network. Um, this would convert that reliability factor to about 99%, which is the percent on time we see the Norristown high speed line uh, running. And as I mentioned, it reduces current commute times by about 30 minutes each way. And then when you get down to the local level in Upper Marion Township, um, it really is essential to support the evolving needs of the township. Upper Marion is seeing a tremendous amount of growth um, and new types of mixed use development coming in as a result of rezoning that happened in the business park area. This really creates the opportunity for them to rethink their very auto dependent uh, patterns of development and by providing the extension and the train line gives the area around the stations a place for transit oriented development growth to occur and not add additional trips to the roadway network. So how does this affect Haverford? Um, you guys are clear winners in this whole uh, project. There's no construction proposed within your township, so you reap the benefits in two different ways. Uh, first of all, your residents and your businesses will get a one-seat ride to King of Prussia. Um, they would simply go to one of the stations in your township and look for a train that is marked as destined heading to King of Prussia instead of Narstown Transportation Center, um, which is great not only for your residents but also for your students. Um, and you will continue to have your existing two-seat ride into Center City, Philadelphia, but with some increased frequency, especially off-peak, um, where since we will have trains coming from King of Prussia back down to 69th Street, uh, kind of one of the side effects of that is that you actually see an increased number of trains available for commuters from your area to utilize. So in terms of the next steps, we are using federal funds for planning um, as well as some design for this project. And we do anticipate federal funds in construction via the Federal Transit Administration's New Starts program. So there is quite a, uh, a detailed way of moving forward that we are beholden to because of those funds. So we've gotten through the alternatives analysis and draft environmental impact statement, which was really the bulk of the planning. We now move into the final environmental impact statement, which just progresses some of the impact analysis for just that locally preferred alternative I showed you earlier. And we have begun that now. It started last month. We expect that to last about 18 to 24 months or so. Um, Parallel to that, we'll be doing both the 20-year financial plan, which answers the biggest question that most people tend to have, which is, where are you going to find $1.2 billion? Um, so that study will address that, and we'll look at various funding options to match the federal funds that we anticipate, which would make up about 50% of the project's capital costs. That also began last month. And then we are preparing right now a request for proposals that should be released uh, sometime late spring, early summer, to advance engineering on the project to 30% design. So we're currently only at the conceptual level, um, about 3% designed, and that, that RFP will advance it all the way up to 30. So these are all um, really good progress on this project. As many of you may know, this project has been studied a couple times over. This is not the first time, but this is the farthest that we've gotten to date over the past couple, couple uh, uh, we'll say, tries. So uh, we're very excited that it's been able to move this far. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you guys may have um, and share any additional information that you'd like to hear about. So it sounds like a, a great project. Uh, I don't think it's all upside for Haverford Township, though, given that we have a real problem with parking at many of our stations. 
So could you address that issue of parking uh, and how we're going to, obviously people are going to use these parking facilities even more now if they can have access to King of Pressure. So it's going to put more pressure on the limited parking that we already have. So what are your plans in that, in that regard? So we are always looking at parking throughout our entire system. It's probably one of the biggest uh, challenges that we face as a transit agency. Um, so as we move forward in this 30% design phase of the project, I think we would certainly be willing uh, to meet and discuss parking challenges more and maybe come up with some additional solutions. That's one of the things that we've been talking about internally in terms of things outside of the scope of the actual extension that will need to be addressed as we progress this forward is the additional opportunity for parking along the existing line. I, I think that's gonna be key for you because I can see from this municipality that you're going to get a, a, a giant jump in ridership going westbound that you don't get here now. But as Mr. Lewis just pointed out, there's no place for our, those residents to park. So that we're already stretched there. We've got parking issues now. So I think as it, since it's only in the conceptual phase, you said you're at 3%, I, I think that's got to be considered where we're going to put, you're going to have two parking rides on the 4.5 mile spur, but in, in the heavily densulated population from, say, city line out to through Bryn Mawr, you're going to need at least two more park and ride facilities that can handle that kind of volume that's going to the King of Prussia side as well. Yeah, we'd be happy to come in okay. and chat with you guys about that and figure out how to move those ideas forward. And when time comes, I'll be glad to, to meet with you. And myself and, and our township engineer, Mr. Pannoni, uh, a few years back, we had an opportunity <clears throat> to uh, participate in some parking initiative uh, plans and, and some ideas. That, uh, we really haven't, we, we've uh, taken some measures and, and addressed and be able to use township funds to improve on some of the parking initiatives. But we, we believe we have some ideas that we can actually share with you that could certainly address some of the concerns of our residents. Okay, great. great. Can, uh, can I just add what Mr. Lewis said though about the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, parking situation. Uh, we have been uh, talked to SEPTA, a property that SEPTA owns about making that additional parking uh, for the, uh, commuters and SEPTA that turned us down so uh, what insurance what uh, reassurance do you give us that SEPTA will look into this because it is a major problem here on our agenda for next week uh, we have uh, people in the eighth ward that want to have permit parking because of all the commuters that are parking in front of their homes so this has to be addressed by SEPTA and there is absolute but I can tell you this uh, all the way from, I guess it would be Bryn Mawr down to 69th Street on the southbound side, okay? Because northbound is the Norristown, southbound 69th Street. Southbound side, uh, basically, that used to be, that was made, there was land made there for four tracks, mm -hmm. not the two tracks. Now, I don't know why SEPTA can't come up with a lot of parking in those areas, okay? But if we don't get some kind of an insurance that SEPTA is going to provide parking for our people, uh, we can't give you any insurance that we're going to buy this plan because it certainly isn't going to help us. It's going to hurt us. Sure. Now, that's one thing. Uh, the other things, will your train schedules change? Okay, what are, you, are you going to run all night long? Uh, right now, we have no plans to change overall hours of service. Okay. Where are your trains getting off? Uh, at the Trenton cutoff to go into King of Prussia, whereabouts up in, the, up in the upper end would be? So it'll be new track. It's not the Trenton cutoff. It'll be new track between Gulf Mills Station and DeKalb Street Station that's actually coming right on the south side of the existing quarry up there. You're going to cut off at Gulf Mills between Gulf no. Mills and what station? DeKalb Street or King Manor. Oh, okay. Gulf Mills, used Park King Manor. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so you're going to cut off there. Okay. And... Uh, Basically, uh, let me just see here. I, I agree with you that it will, for SEPTA's uh, standpoint, it certainly will increase ridership, probably double it. Uh, it'll help with employee uh, things because they'll have to hire more people. There's no doubt about that. But what about the issue of trains? Right now, you don't have enough trains to run on what you have now. So where does that come from? So for the Norristown High Speed Line, when we procured those vehicles some time ago, we actually bought extra trains just for this extension. 
Um, we do run them today. They don't sit or anything like that. So we're likely in good shape for opening day of the extension. When we look long term to 2040, we will need a small number of additional cars, and that's something that we'll be looking at as we move through this 30% design phase of the project to figure out, do we just buy a couple additional cars that are compatible with the system, or timing-wise, does this work out with when we have to replace the NARS Town High Speed Line vehicles due to the end of their useful life regardless? So we're still thinking about that, but we don't need a whole lot of extra trains, so that, that helps us. Okay, so the limit on your trains will be two car trains because otherwise you have to extend every station, right? So we are designing the platforms for the extension to handle three car consists, and then we could potentially run kind of limited express service to some stations where we would improve the platform length and accessibility along the existing North Sound High Speed Line. We have not made those determinations yet. Okay. Uh, I just want to say it in fairness to you and, and SEPTA and the people of King of Prussia and up in the Plymouth meeting area, uh, the benefits are immense to your organization and all. I mean, that you will gain, and the people of Plymouth, what is it there? Is that the upper? Uh, Montgomery uh, County. Upper Marion. Upper Marion. Upper Marion. Uh, there's no doubt that if this doesn't go through, eventually that mall could close, and th the taxpayers of Upper Marion will find out what that'll do to them, which will really raise their taxes very high. So that way, there is a gain. There's no doubt about that. So, but the other changes, I noticed down at Beachwood Brookline, you're taking, I don't know if you know, do you know anything about this, Beachwood Brookline? I'm not familiar with that project. Okay, because it's, okay, that's, that's other work doing, okay. That's uh, our engineering department. I'm in planning. Okay. But, but um, I'm happy to take any questions you have back to them. No, that's all right. I'll, you know, Are I'll you handle sure? that at a later time. Okay. So, um... So I guess I, my, my question would be, are the, the existing number of trains, do we not run all of them now? We do, but we have what's I, called a high spare ratio so that we can easily take trains out if they need to be serviced. I mean, I guess part of a concern for Harriford residents would be, um, you know, we're sort of towards the end of the line to 69th Street. And if it's a situation where there's already a number of mornings where people get on at Penfield, um, you know, where they would have to wait for a train or possibly two to go by. Um, so I guess a concern Hereford Township would have for its residents is that there's not a concept to purchase more trains from the get-go. Um, if ridership is expected to double, um, I, I, I just don't know if that would be feasible. I mean, I, you're, you're obviously more, more expertise on this than I am, but... Um, a lot of times in rush hour in the morning, they're, they're already full by the time they get to Ardmore Junction. Really? This um, is the first time I'm hearing that. That's good to know. So if, if people are standing at Ardmore Junction, I mean, that's Hereford Township that people are not getting on the train and waiting. And that's, you know, that takes away sort of the benefit of, of mm -hmm. the train ride here. Sure. Um, so that, that would just be a concern that I would ask that you really look at um, sure. in planning to not purchase more trains for 2023. So some of the work that we'll be doing as part of the 30% design work moving forward is um, an operations simulation where we actually do computer model all of the additional ridership uh, based upon existing patterns and we figure out how many trains we need for each of those proposed runs. So do we need a one car train? Do we need a two car train? Um, and so those things will be taken into consideration and those are also things that are presented to the Federal Transit Administration as part of their required approvals for the project. So um, if during that operational analysis, it's determined that we don't have enough cars to run service, that there are uh, yeah. what we call pass-ups occurring um, opening year, then FTA will have us go back to the drawing board and figure out how to add some additional vehicles to the system. Okay. It sounds to me like we probably need to do some more updated passenger counts and observations yeah, I mean, it's, on the it's, Norristown High I mean, Speed Line. It's certainly not every morning, but I, I would think it was more often than not. Um, so, I mean, I... I, I, I agree with what Commissioner McGarity said, that this, there's a lot of economic benefit to this, and overall it's probably a great project for the region. Um, you know, I, I was just surprised when you said no additional trains. That, yeah, we that want did, to make sure that, that, that your residents can get on right. when it's running. Because we, we are at the end. I mean, especially going to 69th Street after Penfield, there's not a lot of pickups. So um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I, let me just add uh, two things. Number one, 
there's two des destinations now, right? There's the uh, King of Prussia Mall and the Valley Forge Casino, and then there's also the destination of Norristown. You get, you could, you'd have to watch the sign to get there, right? So there'll be uh, trains destined to Norristown and then trains destined to King of Prussia. Right, so if you, you took the, the right train, if yes. you're going to Norristown and you got on the King of Prussia train at Gough Mills, they would give you a pass, wait for the Norristown train there. That's correct? Um, we have not made any decisions as to how fair will work and SEPTA key will likely be implemented by well, the time this extension yeah. is on. So I don't want to answer specific questions about how we deal with people that are on the wrong train, uh, but we'd make sure they got back onto the right train. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons I'm bringing all this up is years ago, and I, I'm sure it's before your time, but Mr. DeGraw, Ronnie DeGraw from Haverford Township, this, is, this was his idea. They just didn't listen to him. They didn't have the right people there. And it's a good idea. Ronnie came up with a great idea. And uh, it's a shame he's not alive today because he worked for SEPTA and he would be part of the plan putting this together. And it would have cost a lot less at that point. <laughs> That's time, correct. Sure. <laughs> and, and Mr. McGarry's really not concerned about the fare. He's got the Medicare card, so he, fries, he goes for free anyway. So. Thank you very much for your presentation. Very informative. Thank you. Thank you. And, and our website is up here on the screen. I will just say we, we do keep it very up to date. It does not become stale as a lot of these project websites do. So please feel free to go back at any time to see updates. We do update it very frequently. And you can join our mailing list through that link as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wexler, I make a comment before sure. uh, the next presentation. Uh, I want to take uh, an opportunity to apologize to our presenters, um, the board, the audience, and those watching at home. Um, for us to be utilizing this, uh, these old uh, visual aids here. Unfortunately, uh, a few, few weeks ago, we experienced a pretty severe uh, power surge into the building from an electrical issue outside, uh, which caused some severe, severe damage to our uh, state-of-the-art audiovisual system here. Um, we're hoping to have it replaced um, within the next few weeks. So uh, for everyone here and those at home, uh, we do apologize for this antique uh, type of presentations that we're doing. Again, I apologize. But you're still a leg up on the old buildings. So yeah, that's true. Yeah. Many legs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next presentation tonight is by our director of paramedics, Jim McCanns, and the Norbert Ambulance. Are you in there? Okay. Greetings, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Jim McCanns. To my right is Chief Flanagan from Narberth Ambulance Corps. Behind him, Battalion Chief Ian Stoddard. And to my far right, Deputy Chief of Haverford Township, uh, Victor Berg. And I'd like to give you a quick overview on what's currently going on within uh, EMS in Haverford Township and the state of the current relationship with Narberth Ambulance Corps. This will be a joint uh, presentation between myself and uh, Chief Flanagan. <clears throat> Our whole goal from day one has been to uh, form a partnership where we're truly trying to uh, meet the needs of the township and in a very difficult uh, medical environment. EMS tends to be, I think, the lowest on the food chain when it comes to uh, medical reimbursement and what have you. And it's a challenge throughout the industry nationwide. We're not the only ones, but we're working on our way of uh, fixing that. And as you know, we've consolidated quite a few services together. I want to let you know where those divisions are and who does what and who's responsible for what within the township. So as the director, um, I am full time here and I also staff an ALS responder unit. So I have a fully staffed paramedic vehicle. I can't transport, but I respond to calls within the township that there's a system overload, especially if we're having a, a service coming in from outside the township due to system overload, so I can get to the patient and uh, at least hopefully stabilize the situation before they arrive. I also, also if there's a, a very large scale situation, I'll be involved in that. I am uh, on full time by Deputy Director Victor Berg is 20% administrative and 80% primary uh, EMS staff on, in the field. Uh, I res report directly to Mr. Gentili and to the EMS Commissioner, Dr. Hart. I try to give them regular updates on anything that's uh, happening 
uh, any projects we're working on and any difficulties that have been seen within the system. Narberth Ambulance Corps, their uh, portion will be largely covered by uh, Chief Flanagan, but to just give you an idea where the division is and what the contract includes, it's to give us, um, it's to give us two transport capable uh, mobile intensive care units within the township. So they're paramedic and, and EMT staffed and they meet all the uh, state and federal regulations to be transporting uh, ALS units, uh, mobile intensive care units. Part of the contract also covers uh, the medical director, which is Dr. Usach, who is not just a, a medical director for us. Obviously, he is for Narbeth as well. He also covers our uh, SWAT team here in Haverford Township. Continuing in my role, I am the administrator for the contract between ourselves and, uh, and uh, Narbeth Ambulance. And this covers any uh, concerns, anything positive, all the positive things that occur, uh, anything. We, it's kind of like a dance. It's taken a little bit of time for us to, to uh, fully integrate. We're working on it every day, and it's, uh, so far it's been going quite well. I also manage the contract between where the vehicles are housed. We have two vehicles, the two vehicles that we own. One is at the Bonaire Fire Company in the southwestern portion of the township, and the other one's into the more northern end, more northeast end at Haverford College. And uh, that's almost a full-time job, just dealing with the uh, facilities themselves. It's 24-7, it's 365. It's, it's like something of being a landlord. But uh, we do work with these departments, and it's, uh, they are excellent places for us to be uh, garrisoned, and it's been working out quite well. I also oversee uh, any of the township's uh, assets that aren't seen on a regular basis. And that would be things like the EMS bus, which as of right now is about 31 responses over the last five years. That includes large incidents such as the train wreck and trainer, uh, some of the nursing home incidents we've had in the area throughout the county. And it has been a resource for the county and it is being used as a resource here in Haverford Township on uh, numerous occasions as well. We have a uh, four by four uh, off-road type UTV ambulance that was used, I guess it was, it's most recently seen or most obviously seen at the U.S. Open. It was used quite extensively there, but it's used at every Hereford Township Day, every event, any, uh, any of these fun runs or whatever, anything that takes us off into the woods or on trails or whatever, it's, a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, quite an asset for us to go get and retrieve somebody who may be uh, outside of where one of the larger ambulances can go. Another portion of this is to communicate and work with the surrounding services so that uh, we can uh, work out any sort of mutual aid, what units would be coming into our township if they're meeting our standards, and how often we might be going into their township so we remain and keep a balance going. That, uh, and we do that with the county as well, that we give them what our resources are, what our capabilities are, and we know who's coming into our township as well. And that's just a look at the additional vehicles that perhaps aren't seen every day, but are certainly an integral part of our unit. Also within this is um, the responsibility for the tactical medics that are assigned to the police department. We have fully uh, trained, certified, and equipped medics who are uh, within the township and respond and train on a regular basis with the police department. We also have phlebotomists that work with the police department throughout the county as well on the DUI checkpoints and the DUI task forces. We supply them through the township, and that's handled through the DUI checkpoint grant Part of this is also the training of the public. This has become quite a uh, topic as of recent. Unfortunately, in 30 years, 38 years of EMS, I didn't think I'd get to the point where I was taking an instructor course on how to teach responders how to deal with school shootings. But that's the point we're at, and teaching people to uh, apply tourniquets and stop hemorrhaging, and that's even the school-aged children we've been teaching. It's the times we live in but that's the adaptation of a department such as this. So we have started a Stop the Bleed program that we do in conjunction with Lankin All Hospital. We have the um, uh, active shooter class. We just held the first one with our township police department, and we have a second one coming up for the rest of the police department. So that this is a true integration where medics will respond into a facility, into what we call the warm zone, uh, that, uh, with police protection. 
CPR has always been a cornerstone of this department, and uh, we teach free CPR, or at least at cost CPR. If we have somebody come to us who wants to learn, we've never denied anybody. We've even gone to people's houses. They have perhaps an at-risk child or an at-risk uh, person within their home. We'll respond over, and either myself, Deputy Chief Berg, we've actually pulled Mr. Gentili out of retirement to teach some, <laughs> some CPR classes as well. We've also had a large initiative, as I think you can remember, to, uh, to push the hands-only CPR to uh, the community as a whole. We've done it at Hereford Township Day and some other events that have been around here. So it's, we try to be aggressive, we're trying to be proactive, but we're also trying to keep up with some of the things in the, uh, uh, that are growing nationwide and within our communities. But there's more. Uh, as you know, we've been at the forefront of dealing with the Narcan or the uh, narcotics issue with the uh, police administration of Narcan, public administration of Narcan, and we are very aggressive on teaching and giving classes. As a matter of fact, this Wednesday night we have yet another class that we're going out to a facility and teaching how to use, how to identify the use uh, when people are using opioids and how to deal with an overdose. We are part of the heroin task force. We have a seat on that. We've been advising and all of the counties information and statistics are gathered here within Hereford Township. And I'm proud to say we are the only county currently in the United States as a whole that has kept statistics from day one to the depth that, uh, that, that they are kept. They're deeper than anybody else. We have response, we have outcomes. And that has been quite a, uh, quite a, um, a benefit to the entire uh, nation as far as dealing with this topic and it's been uh, cited multiple times now in research and people have been able to spot trends and respond to that because of the statistics coming out of this township. So we've been very aggressive. At the end of the day, um, I'm responsible for uh, the care that's given in this town and uh, I don't pass the buck. It's something uh, I take seriously and something that I'm very glad I have uh, the partners that I do to assist me with that. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chief Flanagan, and at the end, we'll take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners, Mr. Gentile, Mr. Cuthbertson. Uh, pleasure to be before you tonight. Um, as you know, we've been in service for approximately one year. And um, what we did is we decided <clears throat> to give you guys the best service possible by assigning two battalion chiefs, Ian Stoddard sitting behind me and John Servan, work directly with Chief McCann's Deputy Chief Berg to make sure that there's no level of um, either training, calls, or um, taking care of the stations that get dropped. With that, and I'll be brief, um, our team attends meetings with Delaware County. We are at all of the large community events, um, such as Music Fest, Haverford Township Day, and National Night Out. Um, we have currently started participating with the uh, Haverford Police Department active shooter, Deputy, uh, as Chief McCann's had related. And we also plan, <clears throat> we did EMS week initiatives this past year, and we look forward to another year as we um, go through May during the EMS week, where we have a chance to talk about what we do on a daily basis. Um, we also assist the Haverford Township Fire Companies with drills, talk about our rehab program, and we also interact with the Delaware County Community College and their paramedic program. And that is to, there's a constant need, um, besides for financial reimbursement, there is a huge need to keep uh, reinforcing paramedics for the future of the service. Um, as Director McCann stated, there are several different issues that are facing us. I'm going to just briefly run through these. Uh, total calls, uh, 3,200. Um, transports out of those 2,500. Um, Delaware County cover dispatches, which is if we have to go somewhere else, total calls of 213. Um, I do like to put this up just to show people what the kind of differences are. I'm not going to read them off, but these are the type of different um, calls that we go on. Um, syncope is when you pass out or feel faint, as you can see it is a big a call volume. As you're aware, we have large extended care facilities or nursing homes, and they definitely um, call us quite a bit, and uh, we meet that challenge on a daily basis. Um, we are on track to be busy again. Um, EMS seems to be getting a lot of calls due to some of the changes in health care. Um, the kind of the dock in the boxes also draw a new style of call volume and some other things. So we definitely see trends and we track them. 
Some of the Norbeth initiatives, and again, we do it under the watch of uh, Director McCann's and Victor, where we try and bring some of the ideas that we have to give you guys better information. Um, we integrated a new employee time system, integrated a new patient care charting system, which I think is important if the manager, the chief, um, the police want to know what's going on or the type of calls we're having. We are now able to bring that up, and that's something new. And it was a big expense, but we think to be, remain cutting edge, we want to be able to track issues. Also, paramedic performance is at the top of the reasons we have that. Integrated Medical Command Physician is part of the Haverford Township SWAT team, uh, which is an excellent team. I would like to take a minute uh, to thank the support we've gotten from the Haverford Township Police Department and Chief John Viola. Um, you have a lot of police officers out there. They're extremely helpful on the call, and it really allows us to have a, a high quality level of service, in my opinion, here in Haverford Township. And we get support from the fire companies on major incidents and snowstorms. Upgraded the cardiac monitors just to be in sync with EKG transmission and all the cardiac monitoring that goes on on a daily basis with our call volume. Um, we did add uh, what we call CMAX, which basically is a video of your throat that um, helps medics when there's a difficult intubation have the highest quality chance of getting what we call a tube, helping you breathe um, if needed. Um, we also, this new system allows us 100% QA where we review our charts very dramatically with our QA team. And uh, Jim actually is able to review all that information and work with our medical command physicians. Our vehicles are equipped with the ballistic protection just to, and, <clears throat> excuse me, stop the bleed bags, which Jim addressed just recently. I did want to uh, thank the commissioners and ask uh, Battalion Chief Stoddard. We'd like to just present you guys with a, a, an award thanking for the professionals that are out there on the streets. These two state-of-the-art um, ambulances are all-wheel drive. Uh, we don't even have them in our main station. These all-wheel drive are cutting edge. They've changed the way. They used to ride like uh, rough trucks. And these vehicles are really um, something that what I consider very special. Um, they're amazing looking, but they're really here for performance. Um, this winter, we were able to operate flawlessly. Uh, Deputy Chief Berg trained all our people on how to use them. And again, these all-wheel drive ambulances really did perform to a high level. I think I'll stop with the presentation. It's very important. You're always welcome to do a ride-along if you get through uh, Chief McCann's. We're happy to show you, show you our main station which has extra ambulances, which sometimes we lend if there's a problem. And again, the partnership has been excellent, and I think the Haverford Township residents and businesses are in a very good situation with uh, the EMS division here right now. Thank you, Chief. Are there any questions that we can? Any questions from the board? How many EMS providers are on duty at any given time? At any given time? Uh, we have absolutely at any given time four I mean, uh, at least two paramedics, one on each unit, and two EMTs, one on each unit. And they'll divide the calls, whether it's basic life support or advanced life support. If it would be something with chest pain or heart attack, the medic would take the call. If it's something like a more minor fracture or something of a BLS level, then the EMT would take the lead on the call as far as uh, actual patient care. Now, with that, I'm essentially on call for any large incidents. And when I'm uh, on vacation or if I'm away, uh, Deputy Chief Berg steps up into that role, and we constantly communicate with each other who's in town, who's out of town. If the incident's large enough, or even to a large extent, you'll get myself and uh, Victor Berg and perhaps uh, Deputy Chief uh, Stoddard, and we enact at that point the Narbeth command system to start coming into the area. They also, Narbeth has, uh, I think one of the few, if not one of the only ones in Pennsylvania, has a physician that will respond as well if the, if the incident's large enough. So frequently do we need backup? Is there is that pretty unusual or actually it seems to me that we go into other townships more frequently than they come into here. But the actual numbers, I'll get that for you. Do you, do you know offhand, Chris, how often we are uh, calling in other units? I, I can definitely break that down. I don't have that in front of me, so I don't want to give misinformation, but we could have that by tomorrow, no problem. Sometimes it's just the luck of the draw. It just happens to be two calls come in at the same time. And when that happens, then it's uh, myself or uh, Victor have to step up and uh, respond. We'll listen to what the call is and respond in at that point. We also have the added portion here in, in the township, and it does change our dynamic quite a bit, that we have quite a few nursing facilities here. And that does add to our acuity in a number of ways. And especially when you see something up there, you see falls, and you think, eh, falls. Well, falls are the leading killer of the elderly. And especially in a, in a uh, era where people on so many blood thinners. It's a very serious event. So 
you know, all these situations, it's kind of stacking up on us. We do have quite a few nursing homes in the area, which uh, add, add quite a challenge. Do you have an average response time that we... What, uh, when you say response, you mean from out of the call gate or to the, actual, to the actual call? Average response time? Yeah, if I can interject quickly. Certainly. Um, we, come to the mic. Yeah, you come on. The reason that question is a little bit harder to answer is if I can go back to your last question about response times, responses in Haverford Township. So Haverford Township technically has three ambulances on status. They also have 1087, 7B. Um, and Norbeth Ambulance has its own radio system. So we can call into Norbeth Ambulance and have that truck go on status. So when I bring you the number as to how many times it's covered, that number is going to be skewed based on how many times Norbeth has jumped the call, jumped the dispatch, and come in as a third truck. Um, and the last time I did the numbers for dispatch time, it was between five and seven minutes. Okay. From dispatch to arrival, to, to patient contact, actually, which isn't always arrival. I would also, uh, I will email this out to you, and uh, Mr. Gentile, I'll give it to you tomorrow to, for the tension. Good. Good thing. I don't have, Jim, I don't have a question. I would just like to thank you and for being your department and Norbert being so proact proactive and innovative in your approaches. It's obviously a great benefit to our residents. So thank you for your Appreciate leadership. That. And I'm, pl I'm pleased to hear that the partnership is working as well as, as you say it is. Thank you. I know there was some concern from the outset, but it's got to be better than what we had before. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we got lessons learned. Yeah, lessons. Mr. Siegel. Yeah. Well, Two, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Two things. Um, we were talking about response time. One of the things that was brought to our attention when we out started to essentially outsource the EMS was response time, particularly in the in fourth ward and the quadrangle where response time, we were told, was below whatever was antici expected, anticipated. Um, has it improved, especially since you have the ambulance now stationed in Haverford or at the, near the college? Because Absolutely that's they're the largest consumer. And uh, with, um, with the bridge reopening, that did help the numbers. A little bit more as well it gave us a little extra boost but it absolutely has and we are and we are back down below uh the uh response time that's recommended nationally okay so we monitor that and we're pleased to say we're there and the other is what i'll call a marketing concern your ambulances say narberth ambulance in big letters and township of haverford in small letters and the most common question i get is why don't we have our own ambulance? Why, are, why is Narberth responding? Isn't there a way, considering the cost and the finances of all this, for the ambulance that are dedicated to Haverford to make the, the name Haverford Township significantly larger so residents understand that this is their service? And believe me, we thought of that when it, when it happened. Of all things, we were in total agreement for what should be up there, but what dictates it is the state. When I say that, each of these ambulances are licensed by the state, not just licensed like driver's license, they're licensed as mobile intensive care units, as ambulances or as other responder vehicles, but ours are, ours are as MICUs. The, by state regulation, the, um, the entity that has the state licensure has to be the one that has the largest billing. And it's because there's so many places that have integration they want to know basically, hey, whose license is this really? Who are you really coming under? And Narvis vehicles are underneath their license. Narvis, the transport vehicles are under Narvis license. And that goes down to billing and, and everything else. Our vehicles, the ALS units over here, the two responders or whatever, Haverford's more prominently displayed because we have our own license that that's under. So why can't we take the Haverford letters that are in a very light gold and make them darker? so people can read them, because then they would be in the same, unless they're controlling the size of the font and the color, which I don't know. It's the most common complaint, and they're there, but it's very hard to read, but Narberth is clear, and I think it's a, you could change that with fonts and colors. You know what, I will we'll absolutely take that to, uh, to our next uh, management meeting here and, and work with it. Okay, <clears throat> hey, thank you. Jim, um, it's always great to have you around and know you're around in Hereford Township, so thank you and Victor for everything you guys do. 
Um, so you do travel to how many other municipalities? Everyone, every municipality in Delaware County, do you? Do you go as far as Ridley Township? I mean, how far out or, do you uh, Well, primarily, and it's set up through the county. So the county. Through your mutual aid is. So usually, it's, it's always the Jeez. areas that are closest to you. So Marple Township is one of our primary response areas. On occasion, we go into uh, Upper Darby. But they tend to have a program where they float from their more southern areas and bring units up when they're starting to be an overload. And that's such a busy system, they can kind of float constantly. They don't, they never are kind of garrisoned in one place. They're always out on the street somewhere. And um, they also have a little different response time paradigm than we do. But typically it's here and out to Newtown Square. We also go into Lower Marion on a mutual aid as well when their system goes in overload. And Marple used to come into our township a lot. They, do they still do it if you guys are... They still do when they're available. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Jim, yes. I just want to say that, uh, truthfully, um, the, any calls I get, I know I believe you had mentioned the police and all, and I think uh, John sends two police callers to every call, and all I've gotten from feedback from the people where these, pl where these places are is compliments of the great job that the township's doing, uh, and they really, they really like that the service that's there, and... Truthfully, I've got no complaints, nothing but praises. So that's... Thank you. And I would like to mention that with the police department. As far as I know, for Township, as you know, this was the birthplace of the Narcan by police movement. We pushed hard for it. We're not the only people, but we pushed hard and we were ahead of the curve on it. That's been recognized by quite a few people. But our police also are extremely aggressive at starting CPR. And uh, to the point where... Um, when they come in for their CPR training, Deputy Chief Berg has uh, added to their training tourniquet application because it is so important anymore. And, and uh, not just for the officer to put it on themselves, but for anybody, whether it be one of these shootings we hear about or a chainsaw accident or a vehicular wreck or whatever, they're training, they're carrying it with them. But now they're also using a bag valve mask to ventilate somebody. So that's just another step that, that nobody else is, has really embraced, but this township does, and our officers are very aggressive and, and very open to, to uh, performing those skills, which are, that, that makes a difference. It makes a big difference. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Chief, thank you very much. I, just, I forgot, we have a thank you letter for our commissioners of the manager. Thanks. I'm handing those out. Very well, Chris, thank you. Commissioner Singleson, maybe one time we, if one of the newsletters would be allowed just to explain what's going on, that could also help get the word out, and we'll work under Jim's authority to look at the letter. And thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Next item is the police department crime update. Chief Fiola. Thanks, Jim. I promise you I'll be short. Uh, the uh, report for the police department for April 2018, uh, we issued 562 parking tickets. Now the uh, uh, parking meter enforcement people now have are uh, uh, giving tickets electronically. That We now have the uh, keyboards that they print them out and take a picture of the license plate so uh, we can get those tickets out faster uh, with an accurate record of the ticket. Uh, the uh, officers gave out 303 traffic citations with 147 written warnings. We had a strong arm robbery in the 1600 block of Darby Road with the juvenile victims and suspects. The suspect has been ID'd and the investigation is going on. A road rage incident in Westchester Pike 1000 block where a firearm was displayed. A suspect was arrested and the firearm was discovered. We had a motor vehicle theft in the 700 block of East Manoa Road. A disabled vehicle in a neighbor's driveway was towed out. It contained, as he stated, $10,000 worth of tools. Uh, the victim has stopped uh, contacting and talking with our detectives. A giant parking lot of disabled vehicles towed by an unknown person. Uh, the victim discovered the uh, vehicle crushed as junk in a yard in Philadelphia. Uh, we've had multiple sex offenses. Uh, we have a 14-year-old male uh, that uh, uh, met a suspect via social media um, uh, application. The victim will willingly engaged in an act with an adult suspect. That investigation is going on. We had a rape of a 14-year-old victim, another social media app. 
Uh, the suspect choked and, and raped the victim at her residence. This investigation is going on, and the uh, sketch is out there. Uh, we had the indecent assault on the busway, and I'm sure you all saw the newspaper and the news. Uh, we put that out last week. It was going on for two years. Uh, uh, our sketch artist has a broken arm, uh, so he wasn't able to complete it, but we contacted uh, PSP. Uh, Trooper Davis uh, drew a sketch by one of the victims, and it, it, it's, he was uh, uh, identified almost immediately by, uh, by people. Uh, so uh, he was arrested. He's now in the juvenile facility, and that investig investigation is still going on. We expect to have more victims step forward uh, when this uh, uh, becomes more and more. The, 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 the uh, suspect has uh, uh, admitted his, uh, his uh, participation in that. Uh, we had canine usage, a vehicle stop for drugs, a three vehicle investigation, and AOJ, Marcus Hook, Upper Darby, and Radner. Any questions? Thank you, Commissioner. Any questions? Thank you, Chief. Commissioner, committee updates. Any commissioner with any updates? No, just the, uh, I'll just bring up in the chief. Um, we had a great canine competition on Saturday. Um, I'm going to say who won it. I don't even know. I, I, I had to leave. I'm gonna find out right now. Well, we're going to find out. But it was well attended and. Uh, I think uh, another great year for, for the canine competition. And a lot of the uh, spectators love looking at the dogs, going up to them and petting them. It was, uh, it was really good. Commissioner, what, what, what information are you looking for? Who won the canine? I think overall. That, Officer Linker. Oh, well, Linker? Overall. I know he was number one. When yes. I left. Oh, Jan Django, right? Yes. Django won. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Right. Dumb, we said congratulations. Pass it on. Extra biscuits, right? Okay. Extra biscuits for him. Yeah. What's that? I, and I believe they raised okay. uh, close to seventeen hundred dollars. That the money's being donated to the officer's family. From that the, that's correct. That money is being donated to uh, the uh, sergeant who uh, passed away in uh, Newtown Square. Okay. Yeah, they had T-shirts and they had um, donated food by um, Secret Sauce. Secret Sauce. Secret Sauce. Yeah. He, he donates uh, all, all the food. And whatever donations he gets, he turns over to whatever charity we're supporting that. Yeah, yeah Stephen uh, uh, Kelly Wilson. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And they, they go all over doing all these things, and they always give it for a good cause. Yeah, they do. They work very hard. And they're opening up a, a, a restaurant or something? They're opening up a restaurant on Township Line uh, sometime in July. Giving them a little play for what they do. So, you know. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve and Chief. Any other committee updates? There being none, to quick look at the agenda for next week. There are three second readings. There's one traffic first reading and a grant application. Any questions or comments on next week? Let me give this back to him. I may have a minor addition of a proclamation for uh, okay. Eagle Scout. I just don't know if it's this month or next. Okay, so proclamation, no problem. Any other comments? Any questions? We entertain a motion for just adjournment then. How's she doing, Jerry? Second. Second. So moved. Thank you, gentlemen.